try the 3.3 rule. If, if you're a skeptic and you're listening to this and you're like, this doesn't make sense to me, I don't believe it. Um, I have a lot of data in the book that supports that it works. And so my challenge is if you don't believe it works, send me data that says it doesn't work. The only way to do that though, is you got to try it out, try out the actual 3.3 rule. And I'm not just saying for one task, like try it out for a period of time and see if you're not actually more productive and feel a little bit less burnt out by forcing yourself to take breaks. Hello, entrepreneurs and thought leaders. I am so excited today. I have a really special guest. I'm actually bringing on one of my fellow Profit First professionals. Yes, I think he's like one of the originals, like literally one of the OGs of Profit First. And I'm excited because I'm bringing on um, John Briggs, who is a CPA. He's also the owner and founder of Insight Tax. And um, he has just released a brand new book that I'm so excited to talk about that you guys have to get. And it's called the 3.3 rule. Now, this book is like the passion of John Briggs because, you know, he's been an entrepreneur for a very, very long time and, um, you know, over 14 plus years. And he has built a highly profitable accounting firm um, that really focuses on, you know, fighting back the IRS, fighting back with the IRS, making sure his clients get really great um, tax advice. And um, he's really known for really running a highly profitable business and um, that has really overcome a lot of barriers and, and, and unknowns. And, and he's excited because, you know, we're going to talk about today about really the new workday standard. You know, how do we avoid burnout with ourselves as entrepreneurs within our staff? And today we're going to talk about this 3.3 rule. We're going to dive into it and really talk about how we can really maximize your productivity, maximize your staff productivity in a whole different way. So we get to meet the founder of the 3.3 rule today, which is John Briggs. So welcome John Briggs to our platform. I'm so excited to get to talk with you. Yeah, it's so good to catch up and to see you again, Suzanne. Thanks for letting me be here. Well, I'm excited about this book, you know, um, first of all, you know, I've always heard about 3X, 4X, right? And, you know, you have actually honed this down to a science with this 3.3 role, which is really exciting. For you guys that don't know, you know, we're talking about when you're billing for revenue, 3X of cost, 4X of cost. And John has actually broken down into why this is really so important. And so first of all, John, you know, I always love to know the backstory. Why the book? Why the 3.3 rule? What made you come up with this idea? Yeah. And so, I mean, Suzanne, you, you know this, right? We've both written a Profit First derivative book. And uh, when I got done with mine, mine was for micro gyms, I basically said, like, I don't ever want to do this again. I'm not a professional author. Like, this was a lot of work. Unfortunately, as I try to grow my firm, one of my motivations in growing my tax firm is I want to show the rest of the industry that a large firm can change the this is the way it is mentality of sucking the soul out of their team and working 70 to 80 hours a week, knowing that they're going to leave uh, the firm eventually because that's how they're being treated. And so like our firm, for example, we've averaged 42.3 hours a week the last three tax seasons. Uh, we're not quite at 40 hours. We're, we're trying to get there. But so I initially actually started just putting my thoughts to paper for the accounting industry. And then as I shared it with other entrepreneurs and in other industries, I realized how selfish I was to think this was only an accounting problem. It's basically a world problem. Like I'd had lawyers say like, hey, I worked at a law firm that like we needed this information. I'm an engineer. I'm a computer programmer. And then I think entre about entrepreneurs and the sexiness that we see on social media of just work really hard and hustle culture and all this stuff. I'm like, no, I let's get a different voice into this conversation. And so that is kind of what led to uh, the book coming out. I felt compelled to write it. And as you know, once the book is published, it lives on forever. So I wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, it was a worthy reading, not just something that I wrote over a weekend and slapped it together. But I took two years to write. I did a ton of research. I've put my, you know, 15 years of business ownership experience into this thing. And so I'm, I'm happy that it's finally out in the world. And uh, let's see if it can change some lives. 
Well, I'm excited about this book. I mean, like, oh my gosh, you know, it, like it's, it's so nice. You know, it, it actually like feels nice, guys. So you got to get a hard copy. You know, don't just get Kindle, get a hard copy because this book feels like velvety and um, any book that feels velvety is going to like change your life. So um, a very comfortable read too with that. So first of all, John, let's peel it back a little bit just for our audience and let's talk about the history behind the 40 hour work week and just why it just created this conundrum that that we're experiencing. Yeah, and it's really important because in order to understand what the actual rule is, which of course we'll let all the listeners know what that is, we have to understand that backstory. Um, I always think I start with this idea of this analogy I heard years and years ago. There was a little girl and she's in the kitchen. It's a family gathering and they're all she's wanting to help her mom make uh, the pot roast and her mom cuts off the end of the pot roast, puts it in the oven and the little girl's like, mom, I, I want to learn. I'm so curious. Why, why did you cut the ends of, of the pot roast off? She's like, I don't actually know. That's how my mom taught me. Well, the grandma was there. So the little girl asked the grandma, hey, grandma, why did you teach my mom to cut the ends of the pot roast off? And she said, I don't know. Huh. It's just how my mom always taught me. It just so happens that great grandma Gertrude is sitting out on the porch. She didn't wanted to avoid the noise of the kids. Uh, and so the little girl goes up and says, hey, Grandma Gertrude, like, why did you teach your entire generation uh, and posterity to cut the ends of the pot roast off? Is it a secret family recipe? Does it, you know, is, it, is that why the pot roast tastes so good? And uh, Gra Grandma Gertrude said, my pot roast pan was too small. Sometimes we pass a behavior on generation to generation without actually understanding why. And uh, once we understand the why, then sometimes we realize some of our behaviors are completely unnecessary. So late 1800s, average work week, industrial age, 80 to 100 hours a week, six days a week, you know, 15 hour shifts, like bad news, obviously not sustainable. Come along to the early 1900s and you have this guy trying to sell motorized carriages. Uh, initially, it was like, this is a nice, like, who is this guy? This, you know, like, you know, this is a stupid idea. Well, if you're working a hundred hours a week and then you add in the hours you need to sleep and a little bit of time to eat food, do the math. There's not a lot of time left over for anything. Of course, those people are going to think, why would we need this? Like we go to work, we come to bed and we go back and that's our life. So Henry Ford, who wanted to sell more cars, kind of looked at it and said, how do I get people to have the energy and desire to buy these things? you know what, I'm going to give my employees an extra day off a week. So now he created the weekend for us. We get a Saturday and Sunday. And he said, I also don't want them going into that weekend, two days off in a row, completely burnt out. So I'm going to cap the hours they work in a day to eight hours. Now we have this 40 hour work week. He was kind of villainized at the time because you can imagine if everyone else is working their team, 80 to 100 hours, and this guy's paying the same pay for 40 hours, which job are you going to want? Oh, obviously, uh, yeah. Right? Less work, right? More pay, right? So then you, now I'm going into the weekend after only working 40 hours instead of 80, and I all of a sudden I'm like, wow, we have time. We could go to that place we always wanted to go to, but it's a little bit far away. You know, this motorized carriage, this car, this automobile actually might help me get there faster. We can go even further and see places we never dreamed of seeing before. Henry Ford sold more cars. He created the 40 hour work week based on the genius ploy to sell more cars. Like I applaud him for it. It's awesome. Not based on anything in science other than how do I sell more cars? Fast forward a hundred years. And between then and now we have a lot of science that has happened that tells us the 40 hour work week might be just as dumb as cutting off the ends of a pot roast just because that's how it's always been done. Like, so that's where we want to get into the science and talk about it and see how does this actually, what does that mean? Like I'm not opposed to putting in 40 hours a week, but the idea of like this nine to five Monday through Friday, we're hindering our ability to be efficient. I mean, I don't, I don't know if you've ever had any good ideas about your business on a Saturday or Sunday, right? Well, I'm no, not working today, right? Like, oh, what, what's going to happen? No, I love it. I mean, like, you know, we're both profit first professionals and 
one of the things that we talk about is that we fill the space, right? If you give me 40 hours to do a project, I'm going to take 40 hours to do a project. If you give me 20 hours to do a project, I'm going to meet the deadline and I'm going to get it done in 20 hours, right? Um, it's that whole concept of really um, Parkinson's law, right? The, the more I have, the more I'm going to use, the more efficient. I remember like being at Anderson and, um, you know, I always type faster than everybody else because my mom, you know, when I was in high school, she was like, in case you don't go to college, I need you to be a really good secretary. And, and so I typed 80 words per minute, <laughs> you know, I, um, like my fingers would fly until like keys broke off the keyboard. And I remember like at six o'clock looking around at, at my team, you know, and, and I was starting off and, and, you know, they were typing with like two fingers, you know, doop, 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 doop. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm done with my assignments and what the guy did last year that I'm taking over. I guess I'll just ask if they need more help. And like every night we were staying until nine o'clock at night, literally. And I was like, all right, I'm done with my work. Um, you know, I can find out if you need more help. But really it was one person that was taking on the inefficiency of others, right? Um, and, and that creates a whole different host of <laughs> problems, right, with that. Um, but yeah, it definitely, I, that's an example of just filling space, right? Filling space because the time is available. So let's go back now and let's talk about this 3.3 rule and let's talk about why is that so important um, in today's workforce and, and how does that increase our productivity? Yeah, so let's define it and then I'll share some of the foundational science behind it. So the 3.3 rule states the most efficient workday consists of working up to three hours followed by a 30% recovery period. So work up to three hours. So it's flexible. Maybe I only work an hour. However long you worked, take 30% of that time off as a mandatory break after your focus time. So um, there's a ton of science in the book. Hopefully people will buy it and look at all of it and we don't have time to go over all of it. But uh, one of the things that comes, one of the foundational studies that sets this rule, there was a professor at the University of Illinois Champaign, and his name's Alejandro Yedes. And at the time, people seemed to be focusing on this idea of attention span. I'm going to be the first one to discover how long is the human attention span. He heard that question being posed by these scientists, and he, he thought about it and said, I think that's the wrong question because the reality is we are always focused on something. Our attention is on something always. I might be daydreaming, so I'm not working, but my attention is on the daydream. So there's no, he's like, I don't think there's anything such as there's no span. It's really a matter of, can we direct that attention to the thing we actually want to direct it on? So then he started looking at other studies that talked about physical stimulus so if we think about like the clothes that we're wearing that we put on this morning, because we had constant stimulus of the clothes, our bodies stopped registering that stimulus. And now that we're talking about it and bringing it back to our attention, as people are listening and wiggling a little bit, you can feel the weight of your clothes. But until that point, our bodies with constant stimulus will neutralize that stimulus. I mean, they even say, if you stare at an image long enough, that image will disappear from your view. So he said, I wonder... If the same thing happens with the mental capability, does a mental stimulus become neutralized in our brain if it's constant? So he did a study, and sure enough, he concluded, based on the study results, that if you focus on the same thing for too long, your brain will neutralize that, and you therefore lose your attention on that thing which is why we need to build in breaks after dedicated work time. And there's other studies that talked about that's where we get the three working up to three hours is based on some studies in the book. Um, and some studies actually showed people's performance can decline as quickly as 20 minutes. But that's why we say up to three. We want to give people flexibility. And so that the 3.3 rule, most efficient work, they work up to three hours, followed by a 30 percent recovery period. And we have science that backs up why that's necessary. I love it. I love it. Um, and so really, it's about taking that that 30 percent break, really, then. So if you're taking a, a lunch break at noon, I guess your workday would probably start at nine or you're going to take more frequent breaks if you're going to go earlier then. That's what that is. If, if you could have that three hour span. 
Um, and so I guess like if you're incorporating that in your team, because a lot of our entrepreneurs are scaling entrepreneurs, right? They've, they've got team at this particular point. What does it look like in terms of implementing that in your staff, in your company? Um, what does that look like for everyone's day? And, and how do you encourage that without losing productivity, right? Because, you know, I know I am in my mind of minds, I think, oh, we're all working to straight 40 hours a day, right? I'm getting everybody uh, out of this. Um, and so, first of all, you know, let's talk about, you know, realistically, I, I, from from what we're seeing with the study that you did, John, it just doesn't work, right? It's you're right. never as an employer going to get that 40 hours. And I guess we just need to have a come to Jesus moment on that and realize that that's not going to happen except that. But but what does that look like in implementing that with your team, with your staff, with your, within your company. Yeah. And, and to add to some of the stuff, like there's data that I talk about in the book that shows your average team member is producing two hours and 53 minutes a day, even though you're paying them for eight. So if you do the math, I'm actually saying pay them for eight, but really they're only going to work six. Um, but when you add that break in between their focus time and give them permission, the break is important. You are not supposed to do anything work related on that break. And so you can come back completely refreshed because you've let your brain reset and you can come back. So it's super important, but like, yeah, some people think I'm nuts. Like you're only gonna ask them to work six hours. I'm like, yeah, because the studies show they're only giving you half that right now anyways. So there's three general approaches, but I think then we can talk about some of the nuances. Um, I call the three general approaches, the sprinter, the jogger, or the Zen master. So the sprinter is someone who knows that uh, focusing for a really long period of time has never really worked for them. So they typically are going to go an hour on and then take a 20 minute break. In fact, our mutual friend, Mike Michalowicz, when I was talking to him about this rule, he's like, that's interesting. I naturally write for about 55 minutes and then I take about a 15 minute break, which is 3.3. Uh, he's like, well, you know, I really want to get in and I'm in my like writing season of the year. I just, uh, that, that works for me. Okay. So there's the people like that. Some people are like, yeah, I, I can hold up my attention on some things a little bit longer. So we call those the joggers and those maybe go an hour and a half to two hours. Uh, but same deal, whether I worked an hour and a half or two hours, I'm going to then take 40 minutes or, you know, whatever the math is 30 to 45 minutes off afterwards. A Zen master is someone who, uh, is able to focus for the full three hours Sometimes a Zen master even thinks they could focus for all eight hours straight. Like, for example, you give me a, someone's financial statements and ask me to forecast for them. I love that so much. I could easily go eight hours. I thinking I'm being productive the whole time. But the science shows that after three hours, my productivity efficiency is definitely dropping off. So up to three, we want to cut ourselves off at three. And if I do, then I'm going to take the full hour off. But that's the general approach. If we actually think about every job description that our team or we should have, uh, there's so much variety in the different things that need to happen. And so, like I said, forecasting, I could go a full three hours and be totally fine. I'd have to set a timer. I would probably set a timer and be like, hey, three hours has happened. You need to take a break. But like when I was writing the book, an hour and a half was about the most I could sit down and think through it. It's just really hard for me. Um, I'm not as used to it as forecasting. Uh, I'm an introvert. So if you ask me to be a receptionist, I'd probably become a sprinter with those tasks. So we need to be honest. The rule is a lot about helping us have self-awareness for the way we approach, not just our work day, the whole work day, but specific tasks and being honest with ourselves and saying, I don't really enjoy this task. It has to get done though because I'm smart and realize that I can't live my life where every single thing I do is always enjoyable. That's okay. That's life. Uh, but this has to get happened. So, uh, you know, if, if I don't enjoy it that much, most people are going to revert to the sprinter mentality so that they can get breaks in between just because it's not enjoyable. Um, whereas if we have something that we enjoy, it's a lot easier to just sit down and focus on that. Mm, I love that. So first of all, just being honest, you know, about the task that's being assigned as a, a leader, you know, it's just something that they really enjoy doing um, because, you know, they're going to, I, and, you know, I guess with the 3.3 rule kind of equals out whether you do 
45 minutes and then take a 15 minute break or you go three hours. Um, I'm curious, John, what do you think about that? Is it more so figuring out what that person enjoys doing or just factoring it in and encouraging that person to make sure they take a 30 percent break? Uh, it's, it's more of the encouragement. Now, that being said, as entrepreneurs, as we add team, yeah, always better if the team member hiring for the job enjoys doing that job. But again, sometimes I can allow someone to have like, based on what we need as a business, the reason we hire the team member, part of their job is going to be something that they really enjoy. And there's just some stuff in business that isn't that enjoyable and that's okay. But Maybe if I can find a balance between that and then give them permission, explain the principle to them and let them govern themselves with the principle. Uh, Because mathematically, regardless of what method I choose, it's really six hours of work in an eight hour period. Uh, And so as long as I'm getting the six hours of focus time out of them, do I really care how they decide to break that up? No. And I can tell you when I first introduced this to to my team, they're like, is this a trick? If you're just going to fire me, just fire me. Like if you're looking for a reason, like, look, he's not working. Cause like you're saying I have complete permission to just do nothing during my break. And if you walk by and see me doing nothing, you're not going to be mad at me or say, Hey, get back to work. I'm like, yes, it's not a trick. I promise. There's a science, there's an actual book coming out. Hey guys, here's the PDF copy of the book. Oh, he's serious. We can do this. Um, and it's interesting by giving them that permission how much more focused they now are when they're working because they know they're going to be given permission to do other stuff or really kind of choose their own adventure. There's certainly good things to do during break and bad things during, during a break. We can talk about that if you want, but that permission, because without that permission, what happens is we sit down. It's like, I got to be here for eight hours. Well, I do feel a little sluggish right now. So let me just, what's going on on Facebook or look at this notification I just got on my phone. Like we're just, it doesn't work. It hasn't been working. Studies show it hasn't been working. So let's pick a different way. And I think the 3.3 rule can really help us get more done during the day. Yeah. And I think too, as a, as a leader in your organization, you have to also train your own mind too. Like if I see this water cooler talk, you know, and everybody's on break, then I, I just have to accept that I invented this role and, and they're taking advantage. Do people have to tell you up front that I this is my break time or is it just kind of a, a trust type of thing that's happening? Yeah, I've always found trusts, helping them feel like you trust them is important. However, it's also not a great business decision to purely go on trust. So in the book, I have a chapter, as you can imagine, on metrics having a scoreboard is important and uh, it's not a way to micromanage your team. It's just a way to show, are, am I getting results? Cause you talked in the intro, you talked about the four X, three X, four X. Like the reason that's a standard is because we have costs and just covering costs as a business owner will never allow us to stay in business for the long run. We have to have profit, which means the money we put into our team, has to give us a return. And so as we get that return, it allows us to stay in business. So we have to have a way to know that we're getting a return on the cost that's going into them. Super important. I love it. I love it. So let's talk about some common pitfalls that you see with um, business owners as they're implementing the 3.3 rule. Where, where is it that things go wrong, John? And how do we mitigate that so it doesn't happen? Um, and you can add in things that, as I share some thoughts, but if something comes to your mind, like, I wonder if this is a pitfall, please ask me. Uh, the first one is the break. Uh, you kind of talked about it like, man, if I see my team, they're all just sitting and talking. I get that. I have that feeling sometimes. And I'm the one who's done the science. Like I found the science and put it together and I'll still have moments where I'm like, what are you guys doing? Like, I don't actually say that because I'm, it's. It's behavioral. We've all been on this path for a hundred years. So we have to kind of rewire our minds a little bit, but that that can be hard. It's like, you guys are just talking. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. Just talk. I I promise it is fine. Um, And in fact, if you have team members that are timing their breaks together, that's really good for you because that is one of the key indicating factors and longevity in someone wanting to stay with the company 
is feeling like they have friends at work. So getting over that initial like, but this feels like it's against everything I've ever been taught. Like, yeah, on some level it is because we've been taught this is how it is for a hundred years. And um, I don't have a solution to get over that other than give it a whirl and let the results speak for themselves. Um, another pitfall, common pitfall is sometimes team members don't really believe us when we're saying take a break and don't work. And so like in our firm, for example, if I was doing tax returns for three hours, checking my email for the next hour isn't a break. That's still work. It's not, I'm not switch tasking, I'm not saying switch task and the switch task is the break period. I'm saying completely remove your mind from stimulating it the same way that your work stimulates your mind. So like things that really push dopamine uh, are not great, meaning scrolling on TikTok. That, I mean, if you guys haven't seen The Social Dilemma on Netflix, it's a must watch. Uh, the science is scary and they're following principles that get people addicted to gambling. It's the same addiction pattern that's being used on most social media platforms because obviously they make money if you see the ads that are on their platforms, their apps. So they wanna keep you on the app as long as possible. You ever get that notification from Facebook if you haven't logged in for too long? Another one of those things. But so like anything where you're scrolling, just scrolling to like TikTok videos or Instagram things, not great. Now that being said, watching a comedian on YouTube is totally fine. But if I'm just scrolling through YouTube shorts, I'm triggering dopamine. So we just have to be careful on the activities we pick, like app games like Candy Crush and Farmville and those types of things. I don't know what the new things are these days, but all those things are not really great. It's not a good recovery time for your brain, but uh, walking, my favorite thing is to actually just lay on the floor and take a 10 minute nap. Totally appropriate during a break. Talking to people, journaling, creative things. So like drawing, uh, organ like cleaning up your workspace and organizing it, those things are all good. But yeah, anything that triggers your mind to focus on like dopamine things or that, which tends to be the first initial uh, desire for people as they start getting into break time. Um, we got to help them fight that. But th those are some of the common pit pitfalls that come to mind. That makes sense because if you think about it, you know, if, if it's something that's addictive, like TikTok or Facebook, right? It's hard to get back to work, right? It's It, it becomes like almost like a time suck. Like I always tell myself like, I try not to touch my phone when I first get up because I know that that's like an hour wasted, you know, on, on, a, on a weekend of just scrolling when I could be getting started with life. Right. Yeah. And suddenly you're fighting with, you know, that it, it's almost like fighting with your natural tendency, right? We talk about profit first. It's important to work with your natural tendency. And if your natural tendency is to increase dopamine, right. Cause dopamine's addictive, you know, that positive, happy feeling, it's going to be hard to get back to a job that, especially when you're doing something that's not your zone of genius, right? Or something that you don't want to do. And, and it, yeah. it's hard to get back into that. So that totally makes sense from that standpoint. Um, very good thought on that. And I guess as you're talking to your team and you're sharing the 3.3 rule, it's important to talk about those pitfalls about, you know, do you make a rule? Don't go on TikTok. Don't go on Facebook. Don't go on LinkedIn. Um, is it a, a written rule as part of this 3.3 or, or how is that communicated? Uh, we just, again, we try to teach principles and let them govern themselves. So we just do the blanket, like activities like these are stimulating your mind in a way that it's not an actual recovery period. So when you're done and you sit down and work, you're not going to feel ready to focus again for another work block. Um, I think also there's just the general, whether it's a work policy or not, that people start understanding there is now science out there that supports the dangers of social media on mental health. I was just reading an article yesterday, like every year the Senate calls in the owners of like Meta and X and like they, and talk about the dangers of social media and they all play the same story. Like the all, it's the same playbook for all of them. Like nothing has ever said or shown yet that there's causality between social media and mental health, especially in teens and minors. And now there is. Uh, and so, it's, it's, it's a principle. Like, I think we should all maybe be 
just in general, this isn't just a 3.3 rule. I, I think we should all try to find restrictions on the way we use social media. And a lot of phones these days have those, like set a limit, only allow me to be on this app for a certain amount of time. That way, when I'm stuck in that mode of just that time suck, because I've been there. All of a sudden, it's like the app shut off. Oh, I guess it's been 45 minutes. That's crazy. That's good. Make the app shut off. Make the whole phone shut off, right? <laughs> you get the black screen after a few minutes and you can't get back on. You know, I know some some work environments, especially the larger companies, you know, they actually force you to leave. You know, their screen locks. So so being able to set your phone up to lock automatically is, is a great way to do that. And I've heard of some even large firms having something like it just like it blocks somehow it blocks your ability to even go to those apps or use them or it's I don't know how that works. I'm not an IT guy. Infiltration of your personal space. <laughs> I love it. And it's it's true, too. I mean, as leaders, you know, our job isn't just to teach productivity at work. Sometimes we're mentors in life, too. And really accepting that role that, you know, we're, we're gifting our team and our companies um, and our staff with roles to help govern their productivity in life, too. And, and making it, you know, about, you know, I remember in my early part of my career, you know, our, our company sent us to um, learn Stephen Covey, right? Learn that time management. And even though it was great for the company and, and expensive, you know, in some cases, you know, that those planners were, you know, a couple hundred dollars back then, you know, we were learning life skills too. And and we're teaching life skills in the workforce with our people. Because Agreed. we want them to be successful. I actually think it's one of the most fulfilling aspects of being the entrepreneur and providing for people's families like because of us as entrepreneurs there are people who are putting food on the table and supporting their family and i've always felt like we can have the technical training meetings which we do but like once a week we have a team meeting and those trainings are always focused on skills that allow us to just be better people um certainly we get benefit as the entrepreneur crucial conversations for example wow let's teach some skills on how we can have difficult conversations with each other Turns out you get to take those skills to your family and have better conversations with your spouse and children about like it. Yeah, I, I'm with you, Suzanne. I think as entrepreneurs, we should be helping elevate their lives in all aspects. Now, I know that you had a really great section about remote work and um, it had some interesting content um, that was a little bit controversial. And so, John, let's talk about that um, as we wind down a little bit. Remote work, does it really work? And what did you discover in your research? Yeah, um, man, I, I so wanted to find the answer for remote work. Because uh, if you look at the literature and the quote unquote studies that are out there, you have everyone on the full end of the spectrum to remote work is going to get me into heaven or remote work is the spawn of Satan. Right. It's like and, and what I have found in the research, looking at it unbiasedly, is that both are, can be true because it completely depends on the person. Um, I can tell you, like when COVID happened and we all had to work from home, that lasted for me for about four weeks. And so I'm like, you know what? No one's at the office. I'm going to go work at the office because there just wasn't enough boundaries that I could establish at my house to allow me to be productive. And part of that's on communication with my spouse. Part of that's just on me. It's like, I'm in my house. Usually when I'm in my house, I do these things. So I have behavior things that I'm trying to fight. And you have people who work remotely and they're like, oh, I want a remote job. And they get the job and they all of a sudden are miserable. They don't have social connection like they want. Some people thrive on that. Some people don't need it. Um, so my stance is, if you're hiring five star fits, um, which is a phrase from Mike McAllister's new book, All In, or if you refer to them as A players, um, they know what environment makes them the most productive. I have five star fits that work remote and are crushing it. And I have other five star fits who tried it and they're like, you know what? I got to work in an office space. I'm better here. I think we just need to for sure use our judgment with our team but let's see like if someone's like i need to work remotely but they're not producing again it goes back to roi and metrics uh you're not producing bob um we're gonna need you to come into the office or if you live in a different state it's just 
it's not going to work out. You're not producing enough to justify our investment in you. Um, and so that was the initial thing on remote work. And then the other thing that applies from the 3.3 rule standpoint, in order to avoid the feeling that you're living in your office, which can happen to some people who work remotely, the 3.3 rule is applied a little bit differently because you're at home. And most of the time, people who work remotely, I have found they're doing it because they need the flexibility based on their other personal life responsibilities, which is fine. Again, if you do the math and a team member works six hours in a day, you've, in my opinion, have maximized their productivity and you should be getting a good return on that investment with them. Do I really care if they're deciding to work between six and nine and then three and six in the afternoon? And for some reason, they're not available in the middle of the day? No, I don't really care because they've picked that schedule if we trust them and hired them because we trust them based on what works and maximizes for their life. So sometimes the 3.3 rule is focus and do work however long that needs to be, but maybe your 30% recovery period is going to be longer than 30% because you're just now, you're just going to do, go do some life things like picking up and shuttling kids to different things could be one of those things. Right. Um, so we just need to, I think, allow a little bit more flexibility. And again, people are listening to this, I am anti-hustle culture. I, I don't like the idea of just killing people, but I, I believe in hard work. When your team is working, when you're working, you should be working and focus and get as much done during that time period as possible. I mean, a lot of my book is on, look, the 3.3 rule is as easy to adopt right now. Like everyone who listened to this right now, you can do it tomorrow. Set a timer, take 30% off when you're done and you realize, hey, you know, I'm losing focus. I'm going to take a break. But we need some more flexibility in the way in which we're saying, let's be focused. So the book talks about how do I maximize my focus time? And there's lots of things that we can do as entrepreneurs um, to allow us to do that. I love that. And it's so many valuable lessons with that, John. I mean, first of all, you know, as a person that's doing 3.3, right, if you're a team member, right, it's important to know thyself, right? Um, You know, if I was working a six to nine schedule and then a three to six schedule and and doing life in between, I think I would be exhausted on that final six to nine schedule, right? And so that wouldn't work for me and and it wouldn't be fair to my employer either. And so it's important to have that discussion and, and really just know thyself. And from an employer perspective, just like John said, it's important to really be tracking and measuring it. And, and looking at those KPIs um, to make sure that everybody is doing their fair share, right? Um, and meeting those metrics, you know? Um, and, and I guess the question becomes like, what happens if you have someone that's typing 80 words a minute that's working like two people um, versus one that is, um, you know, two, two finger typing, right? I guess that becomes a whole different story, right? Um, in terms of that, but you can't be afraid of having that crucial conversation where you're counseling people out that just don't fit the culture. Well, let me add to that, because um, if I had a team member who's typing 80 words a minute and that somehow tracks and I can see that there's more value to me as the owner, that person should be making a lot more money than the person who's two finger typing because they're more productive. We A core belief we have at our firm that it's just a personal belief of mine, which is why it's part of the firm, is value creation. What is the exchange of value going on? And we encourage our team members if you feel like you're contributing that much more revenue compared to your cost, let us know. Let's see the data. Like we try to do that proactively on our own as leadership. But if the team member doesn't feel like we're doing it fast enough, in this case, the person who types 80 words a minute could come in and say, like, I'm not only getting my work done, I'm actually stepping in and helping them. So you could give me more of a workload if you want, because in the six hours that I'm going to be focused and working for you under this rule, I'm going to get a lot done. And you can see how much I get done. Therefore, I'm asking for a raise because I think it's deserved. And a good entrepreneur is going to be like, absolutely right. This is well-deserved. Oh, yeah. You're, you're letting gold walk out that door if that person is unhappy. So yeah. um, you got to figure out what makes them happy and, and definitely make that work for them. Now, John, one of the things that we like to ask our guests as we wrap up and close out, you know, is if you could leave our viewers, our listeners with one piece of advice, what would that advice be? 
Uh, I'm going to go with try the 3.3 rule. If if you're a skeptic and you're listening to this and you're like, this doesn't make sense to me, I don't believe it. Um, I have a lot of data in the book that supports that it works. And so my challenge is, if you don't believe it works, send me data that says it doesn't work. The only way to do that, though, is you got to try it out. Try out the actual 3.3 rule. And I'm not just saying for one task, like try it out for a period of time and see if you're not actually more productive and feel a little bit less burnt out by forcing yourself to take breaks. Um, so that'd be my advice. Just give the 3.3 rule a chance. I love it. I love it. You know, make everybody a six hour work day. <laughs> um, and so John also, um, you know, how do our viewers and listeners, how do we find you? How do we connect with you? How do we learn more? Yeah, the, the best place is uh, go to our website. It's 33rulebook.com. I couldn't put the dot in the 3.3 based on the way internet addresses work. So it's 33rulebook.com. That's a great place to start. I love that. So the 33rulebook.com, then you guys can get this book anywhere that books are sold. Um, the 3.3 rule by John Briggs. So definitely check out his book. Amazing book. And um, definitely change your company, change your lives, and change everybody else's lives for the better, too, as, as you're doing this. Thank you, John, so much for joining us today. I'm going to go ahead and put John's um, contact information in the show notes so you guys that are driving. When you get it to a safe place, you can um, be able to pull over and find him and learn more. But, John, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, I'm so grateful you gave me a chance to share this. Thank you.